Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG. I also serve in a leadership role with the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, or GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at unprecedented scale and speed. This is being done by providing a coordinated and holistic approach to the necessary knowledge, education, and support to power system operators across the five action pillars. The foundation of the GPST is a group of six system operators from around the globe who are facing higher penetration of wind and solar inverter-based resources sooner than any other operators in the world. The five pillars of the consortium are research and peer learning, technical support, workforce development, technology adoption support, and open data and tools. ESIG is the lead on Pillar 1, and more information on the GPST can be found at globalpst.org. As the lead on Pillar 1, ESIG would like to welcome you to the July monthly webinar of our joint GPST Pillar 1 ESIG webinar series. The series is in addition to the regular ESIG monthly webinar series and focuses on the GPST research agenda and associated topics being addressed in Pillar 1. Topics are presented by both the founding system operators and other advanced system operators active in Pillar 1, as well as members of industry and academia participating in the activities of the Research Agenda Group and the Research Advisory Committee of Pillar 1. An additional series of webinars on the other four pillars of the GPST is also being provided on a monthly basis through NREL. For those of you who would like to learn more about GPST and how to engage, please go to globalpst.org and click on the Get Involved tab. Further information on ESIG can be found at esig.energy. Next, I'd like to go over a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. For the Q&A, we'll use the Slido platform at slido.com. You need to open a browser window, go to slido.com, and enter ESIG12 as the event code. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the questions on Slido to allow you to cast a vote to help prioritize the questions submitted. We plan to save about 10 minutes or so for Q&A at the end and then wrap it up at the top of the hour. An email with a link will be provided once the video file has been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar so please don't be afraid to ask your questions through Slido. Okay, so today our webinar is gonna cover wind and solar power forecast management in the ERCOT system. This is a topic which is gaining increased traction with system operators all over the world with the increasing shares of wind and solar power being added to the system. Today's webinar will feature Nitika Mago, Manager for Balancing Operations Planning in the Operations Forecasting and Ancillary Services Planning Department at ERCOT. In this role, she is responsible for a number of operations planning activities, including grid balancing and frequency control, inverter-based resource integration and energy forecasting, ancillary services, and event analysis. In case you missed it, Nitika just shared a great session at our forecasting and markets workshop on the integration of probabilistic forecasts with the EMS and MMS systems. I'm very pleased to have ERCOT as a member of ESIG and to have Nitika here with us today. Today's webinar will provide a holistic view of ERCOT's wind and solar power forecast management strategies, including tools, procedures, and approaches that have been instituted or in the process of being implemented within the next 12 to 18 months. We'll also explore the development of new analysis tools to better manage the challenge brought on by the variability and uncertainty of ERCOT's wind and solar fleet. Okay, just a short reminder once again to use Slido at slido.com with the event code a VSIG 12 to ask your questions. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Nitika, I'll now turn it over to you. Hello, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Charlie. And hello, everyone. Uh, uh, let's go ahead and I'll, I'll spend less time uh, I'm, uh, on introducing myself again, but uh, through this stop, but through the next um, 30, 40 minutes or so, I hope to share with you a lot of what uh, ERCOT has uh, uh, 
put in place in order to support the volumes of uh, wind and solar resources uh, that ha have interconnected into our grid. Uh, as has been mentioned, please feel free to, feel free to share questions. We will uh, try to answer them. Uh, and with that, let's 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 get into the matter. So uh, today, uh, from an outline perspective, uh, I'll start out. Of course, to, to those of you who are uh, not very familiar with ERCOT, I'll provide uh, uh, an introduction through ERCOT primarily through some high level statistics of our grid. Then I'll get into and spend some time talking about some of the key features uh, that have furthered renewable integration uh, 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 in, in our cut region. I'll share with you uh, how our cut looks at our ancillary services now that we have the type of uh, 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 renewable resources on our grid to cover risks. And lastly, I'll share uh, share with you some uh, uh, interesting tools and analysis that we've developed uh, that help us better monitor uh, our, our renewable fleet and uh, stay aware about our uh, uh, about our uh, on, on come, upcoming operations and the risks that we see. So with that, I'll keep get started. From a perspective of records, ERCOT is typically a summer peaking uh, region. Our peak demands usually, or peak demand records are usually set uh, uh, in in summer. So the uh, the most uh, the highest demand we've seen so far is actually uh, here from this week. Uh, it's a, we are in in the midst of a heat wave. And uh, at least, uh, and here uh, um, uh, the 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 record we saw was around seventy-eight thousand five hundred megawatts uh, of load that was served uh, between the hours four and five p.m. on July eight. Uh, we've also uh, um, had a, a a weekend peak demand record, which was about seventy-four thousand nine hundred and seventeen megawatts in June this year, uh, June twelfth. Um, last year winter and uh, during or last year February during a winter weather storm, we hit our winter peak demand, uh, which came very close to our uh, previous summer peaks of around 69,150 megawatts. Now on the uh, wind side, the uh, instantaneous uh, record generation that we've seen from wind resources uh, is from May 29th uh, this year. And it was roughly around 27,044 megawatts uh, at around 10:30 p.m. in the night. From a penetration perspective, uh, on, on April 10th uh, this year again, uh, early morning hours around 1 a.m. 1:43 a.m., 69.15 percent of our load was being served by wind. So that's roughly around uh, 23,968 megawatts. System inertia at the time of this penetration record was roughly around 122 gigawatt seconds. Uh, now, from a lowest uh, uh, inertia that we've seen on our grid, uh, the lowest record that we've set is around 116 gigawatts. So this was about just seven gigawatts shy uh, from that lowest uh, record that we've set. So uh, you've seen various graphics likely of ERCOT and the amount of uh, renewables we've added on our grid. Here's a, a combined perspective of looking at both wind and solar uh, uh, growth in our area since 2000. Of course, it started with the wind resources. We roughly have about, uh, as of today, or uh, as of May 2020, we have roughly about 30,000 uh, giga 30,000 megawatts of uh, wind installed and synchronized in our grid. There is some amount of it that is still uh, in, in the process of commercialization. Uh, we have uh, about 10 to 12,000 uh, gigawatts of solar uh, installed on our grid. Uh, solar really started picking up uh, here in these past few years. You'll see uh, the you'll see the size of those bars become fairly significant and. Our, uh, while our future outcomes are really uncertain, we do right now still see quite a bit of interest in developing both wind and a lot more interest in developing solar resources on our grid in the next few years. 
I threw in this one more graphic. We are starting to see a lot of uh, interest in uh, bringing in energy storage resources uh, into our grid as well. We have about uh, about 2300 uh, uh, megawatts uh, of uh, re energy storage resources that are in our systems. Some of them are still in the process of commissioning. We are projecting to add another 4500 by the end of 2024. So here's another look of our interconnection queue, uh, and and uh, and really again, what uh, the key takeaways is we are seeing a lot of interest in adding more wind, uh, much more solar resources, and much more batteries than any other resource type. Um, so uh, both wind, uh, so wind, solar makes about 53% uh, of our uh, of the queue. Batteries make about 30% of the queue, and then wind makes about 10% of the queue. Um, now, here's one more graphic, uh, just to uh, again put the how our resource mix has evolved uh, over time. So the uh, the comparative here is between 2010, 2015, and 2020. Um, and really, what you will notice is the uh, the the size of the pie for our coal resources has shrunk in these ten years. the The size of the pie for the natural gas fleet has grown. Our nuclear fleet hasn't really changed. So you're you're seeing some certain percentage differences, but that pie has been fairly steady. But uh, when we were uh, essentially uh, as our coal fleet was retiring, we were adding a whole bunch of wind and gas units to our system and these uh, uh, and these two together have really worked hand in hand so when we've had uh, we've had these uncertainties or we've had variability in our uh, re renewable generation output we've been able to rely on our grass fleet to come supplement uh, and fill the gap so to speak uh, uh, one more graphic for you. I touched upon what this was. We have been tracking our ERCOT system inertia over time now, and the lowest we've seen uh, uh, our system inertia go is roughly around 115 gigawatt seconds, and that was in March of this year. So really switching over and talking to you about some of the key features that have furthered renewable integration. Really, there are four primary pillars in our minds. One was really to have a, a robust grid code, uh, make accounting for renewable forecasts in our uh, studies, be it, uh, be, it be it dispatch or be it future, future looking studies, continuously refining our ancillary services uh, 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 to react to help us uh, to help us account for the risks that that uh, that we were looking to see with the with the renewable fleet growing, and of course precise or real time operations that is able to follow what our requirements are uh, uh, what our requirements outlay. So to these all these four items together have helped us. Uh, Bring, bring on the volumes of renewable resources that we have onto our grid. So, so give you a very high level perspective of our grid code. Our grid code requires frequency response uh, from our renewable fleet when they have headroom. So uh, on the uh, so for a low frequency event, if a resource is curtailed, we expect it to provide uh, primary frequency response. Uh, of course, for high frequency events, uh, there is uh, always a response expected. We do expect our uh, renewables, both wind and solar set of resources to be able to ride through voltage and frequency disturbances. We expect our resources to provide voltage support. Mm. So, uh, um, and, uh, and of course, we, there is a, a, a concept of a ramp rate limitation in our uh, in our rules which basically contemplates that uh, ramping of a renewable resource is limited to 20% of its nameplate rating so essentially it needs to take 5 minutes to ramp up to its 100% uh, output if it is starting from zero uh, switching topics and really spending some time talking about our reno our wind and solar forecasts ERCOT implemented a centralized forecast for wind in 2009 
and for solar in 2016. And before I, I move on, I do want to impress the solar resources we are talking about here are utility scale solar resources that are connected to the transmission grid. That's the, that's the primary focus of all of the numbers you're seeing and all of the data you'll be seeing in, in, my, uh, in, my, uh, in my slide deck today. Um, we work out has a very a small fleet of behind the meter uh, solar resources. Now, in 2017, sorry, moving back to the topic of forecasts, in 2017, ERCOT contracted a second provider for wind forecast. And uh, really this year, um, just about a couple months ago, we contracted a second provider for solar resources as well. So we essentially have two forecast providers for wind and two forecast providers for solar forecasts. Uh, we receive um, uh, various types of forecasts uh, from our uh, vendors. We receive an hourly forecast, which projects uh, uh, the forecast on an hourly granularity for the next 168 hours. We also receive an extreme event forecast. So this, I think about an icing uh, impact forecast uh, for wind resources. Um, or a or a hurricane type event. Those uh, on those events, what is the risk of a reduction in the uh, uh, in the forecast or or in the uh, generate availability of these resources is sent to us uh, on an hourly basis again uh, for the next 168 hours. We also receive an intra hour forecast. So this is a five minute resolution forecast for the next two hours. Primary inputs to our forecast are, are really uh, information we receive at a resource level from our fleet. So site location, uh, they have a meet, they are all required to have a meteorological tower from which they send us um, meteorological data. Uh, the, so the location of that tower, the wind speed, the temperature uh, and temperature operational limits. So what is the high speed cutoff, low speed cutoff, high temperature cutoff, low temperature cutoff. Telemetry, telemeter data, anything from meteorological information uh, uh, that is more current to the site or uh, its current output, its current capability, how many turbines it has available at this point, how many turbines are out on maintenance, things like that. Any scheduled outages or derates on the resource, uh, generic power curves, and of course, weather variables uh, are used to derive our forecasts. Uh, the, the graphics that you're seeing here also share with you what our uh, hour ahead and day ahead forecast performance for wind and solar have looked like on an average our um, hour ahead forecast performance for wind is around uh, 2 percent just a little, little over 2 percent and our hour, hour ahead um, forecast error for solar is around 3 percent. We've made several uh, improvements to our forecasts ever since we started receiving them in 2009. I, I have listed quite a few of these in here. I'll call out a few that uh, are of significance, uh, but, I, but I'll try not to step through all of them. Uh, we do have the capability of overriding a wind forecast we receive from our vendor. So uh, uh, if there is a more recent information that the control room is aware of that is impacting a region or a fleet of resources, they have the ability to go and uh, change the forecast that gets used in our studies. Um, we have, uh, our, uh, we have uh, oh, since about 2018, when we integrated two vendors for wind, we've provided our control room the capability to decide which forecast will be active. Uh, in 2018, when this was implemented, it was implemented in our EMS system. Uh, in uh, 2022, as we are integrating a, 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 another vendor for solar, we've actually, uh, we are all in the process of uh, creating a forecast presentation platform that will essentially serve as the house uh, for um, all or renewable forecasts we receive and any activity, be it related to monitoring, forecast selection, uh, uh, will now be uh, sourced right in that particular web-based tool that we are developing. I've got some more slides to share with you on this. Uh, we've recently deployed this tool into our real-time operations. Um, 
And last year, as our solar fleet started growing uh, tremendously, we also uh, acquired the capability to manually override our solar forecast. Again, the use case for this is very similar to wind. If we start seeing a consistent uh, error uh, that that is driven by resource availability uh, uh, in our forecast, uh, the control room has the f flexibility of uh, of updating the forecast that our studies use. Um, so let's see, actually, sorry, I'm going backwards. I apologize for that. Now, here's one more graphic, which I, I'm gonna step into a lot more details, which talks about how, uh, which was summarizes essentially how forecasts get used uh, within our systems and uh, functionally what they do. The forecasts that we receive are consumed in some way, shape or form by our EMS system and our MMS system. The EMS system uses it uh, to, uh, to uh, compute what a predicted ramp rate at which the wind and solar resources will be ramping in the next five minutes so that the uh, real-time dispatch can take it into account. Mm -hmm. uh, it also uses it to run some analysis around uh, resource avail uh, uh, available, resource availability to serve forecasted demand. We'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, uh, our market system use our forecasts so that they can be used in studies like uh, uh, reliability unit commitment. They can be used in our other studies like outage coordination, next day studies, um, so on. And of course, these forecasts also get used in setting our uh, reserve requirements, specifically to a reserve uh, called non-spinning reserve. So, so let's step into that in a little bit. What I'll do is I'll start out first by talking a little bit about our operational reserves and then switch and talk with you all about um, the tools that we have. Now, uh, again, there is a, from a reserves perspective, I'll give you a very high level overview, just so they all can get, get an, uh, an idea of how, how these renewable forecasts play a role. Um, we have, uh, uh, we call the reserves ancillary services in our market. Uh, these, uh, we have three types of ancillary services, uh, regulation, uh, uh, non-spinning reserve and responsive reserve. So regulation is what we use, uh, uh, our LFC is used, uh, uses to balance supply and demand between five minute capacity market, energy market runs. Uh, Non-spin reserve service is really a, 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 a capacity that we can, uh, is, that is typically offline that we can get, bring on within 30 minutes. Uh, so it's really used for, um, uh, for, uh, for days when we have uh, large net load forecast errors or unit trips. Uh, responsive reserve is a frequency uh, service. It, it, typically, it's a, it's a primary frequency response headroom that uh, is being reserved uh, to be available uh, in the event of where, when we have a large frequency dip. Now, a point to note here is uh, by, with ERCOT's changing generation mix, ERCOT stakeholders uh, and ERCOT have continued to focus on the design of these uh, uh, services to in ensure that they can still be used to maintain system reliability by responding quickly to sudden changes in load and generation. Our types of AS really hasn't changed by much over time. The way we've really adapted is by tweaking the methodology we use to compute the requirements for these reserves. Uh, <clears throat> now, having said that, we are also in the process of uh, implementing what will become a fourth type of reserve. Uh, in our system, it's uh, it's a 10 minute ancillary service. We call it ERCOT contingency reserve service. Uh, the, we envision it uh, as uh, something that will help us with, uh, of course, recovering frequency following large large trips, and uh, help us with uh, responding to short term net load ramps. So that will really be the first time. Next, so sometime next year when this gets implemented, that will be really the first time when we'll be. Uh, 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 changing the count of uh, ancillary services on our uh, on our uh, system. Um, so uh, switching over, talking with you a little bit about regulation. As I mentioned, this is the one that we use for balance uh, for maintaining frequency uh, between our dispatch intervals. Uh, 
This is typically provided by supply side resources like generation and energy storage resources. Uh, the requirements for our regulation quantities are determined based on uh, five minute net load variability that we've seen historically in the last two years. Um, and we also include some amount of adjustments uh, in our uh, quantities to account for projected growth in our wind and solar capacity. Um, so generally, as we've added more and more, uh, these, the, if you look at these graphics more closely, as, as we've added more and more uh, uh, resources, uh, 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 like of, uh, this particular one is talking about wind resources, our regulation requirements have stayed, uh, have either decreased or stayed fairly steady. So we've, uh, it's only that in this year that we are uh, 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 with, the, with the huge changes in solar that we are seeing a slight uptick in our quantities. Uh, the next reserve that is of note is non-spin. I spoke about it just a bit ago. Uh, it's uh, non-spin uh, really is a capacity that can be started in 30 minutes and is used to cover uh, net load forecast errors. Uh, specifically, we look to cover risk associated with six hour ahead uh, uh, net load under forecast errors uh, and intraday forced outages. We uh, the, the methodology is set up such that we uh, Larger quantities of non spinning uh, uh, are usually procured during hours where there is a, a higher risk for net load up ramp. So, uh, uh, if you think about a, a let's use a, a winter peak as an example, when your uh, when your load is ramping up and your wind is ramping up, down, those would be the hours where we would look to uh, uh, have more protection or more coverage uh, in our non through our non spin requirements. In our non-spin quantities, we also include certain uh, adjustments uh, on top of what we have seen uh, uh, based off of history to account for uh, increases in uh, over forecast errors in our wind and solar because of growth in their installed capacity. Uh, roughly that error, that, that uh, uh, adjustment, at least I think if I remember correctly, in case of solar averages to around 90 to 100 megawatts per hour. Now, so, so switching from how we set up our reserves to how we go and monitor our resources uh, or our renewable generation fleet, over the years we've developed several to tools uh, that help us monitor uh, the the fleet that has uh, integrated into our uh, that is currently integrated and operating, we uh, that helps us make changes to the forecasts that are used in our real time dispatch and future studies, and uh, tools that conduct analysis uh, 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 of how uh, of what the impacts of changes in wind and solar generation could be on our reliability on our on our operations. Of, uh, uh, so the, there are a couple of graphics here right in front of you. Uh, the, the the bottom one shows a uh, the, the small graph that is on the bottom shows um, a, a, a preview of uh, what our total wind generation looked like uh, in blue uh, in the past 24 hours uh, and what it may look like in the next 24 hours. Um, so you'll notice the the trend goes from being a smooth trend to very blocky. So that's really that's where the transition occurs, and it does it stacks the solar output on top. So you tend to get a pretty good example of how the solar has ramped up and what we expect it to do for the rest of the day. Uh, we also have the displays that uh, provide uh, that. So this is a system level preview. The control room has the ability to go uh, the different levels of granularity or to look at this data at different level of granularity. So one granularity is what we called as regions. So in front we have about five uh, about five regions for wind in our grid. So they can look at how the individual regions are performing, or they can click through and look at the individual resources that are within these regions to get a preview of what all of those individual resources are behaving or operating at. Um, uh, so it really depends on the, what, what type of use case uh, of what type of monitoring the control room is looking to do. They have the ability to set that level of granularity for their work. 
Something else that we've developed is what we call as a capacity availability tool. This is really a, 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 a we can I consider this to be a what if assessment uh, for the next six hours. So what will happen? Uh, uh, what will happen to my primary problem of be, being able to serve the, the the load that I'm forecasting if there was variability in my wind fleet or if there was wind uh, variability in my solar fleet. So we uh, we essentially take the problem of uh, uh, the simple problem that. Uh, 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 simple problem. The problem of looking at uh, supply versus demand, and then we give our uh, uh, give our control room or give our engineers the flexibility of applying uncertainties uh, to the data set. So, uh, so what happens if uh, uh, so, so? So that what they can do is they can take this um, uh, available generation. Uh, so this is the available supply that we have available to meet the green line, which is the forecasted demand. And, uh, and what happens if uh, uh, and, and run an assessment which says what happens if um, if uh, the wind comes in 3,000 megawatts less than what I am assuming uh, uh, is available right now? Am I still able to serve the forecasted demand? And so you'll notice here uh, in, later on in this graphic, uh, it looks like we uh, we we uh, the forecasted demand exceeds the amount of available generation we have available with that uncertainty applied. So essentially <clears throat> this sort of assessment we we run for a next six hours, next next eight hours basis to try and gauge uh, how the things could change uh, where our uh, where our forecasts uh, that, uh, the, were the weather to be such that uh, there, there be uncertain there will be more uncertainty in in the amount of wind and even solar resources that we are counting on. We are uh, so that so this graphic was at an hourly level or this what if assessment was running for the future hours. We are also in the process of creating a intra hour <coughs> capacity availability tool. So this is going to run a similar what if assessment, but it will run it uh, for the next two hours on a five minute basis. So really this is a tool that will be monitoring uh, the forecasted net load ramp that we see in the upcoming two hours and sub gauge the sufficiency of our uh, 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 of a, the sufficiency of the ramping capability of our thermal fleet to cover these. Uh, so the the graphic is very similar to what I showed you, at least in terms of uh, information that we are looking to sh uh, to uh, to share with the control room. Uh, so over. Now, the next thing I said we have, we have been actively working uh, this year to develop is a forecast presentation platform. Uh, so we quick as we started adding more and more uh, vendors and more, more different uh, and, and started seeing the need to add different type of forecast models, we quickly realized that the EMS that with the, where we had started by housing our uh, uh, wind and solar forecast wasn't the right place. And uh, we needed, uh, we ended up deciding to develop uh, in-house a web-based tool uh, that would uh, that would end up serving as the home for uh, our forecast. We have started by bringing in wind and solar forecast. We are open to exploring if even if we can even bring our load forecasts. There are different types of challenges uh, that we may face uh, in, in integrating our load forecast. So right now. Uh, that's a uh, that's a topic for a separate day in our minds. Uh -huh. um, so really, uh, so uh, so this uh, presentation platform uh, through this presentation platform, uh, we'll be sharing with the control room. Of course, everything that you can think of: resource level forecast information, region level forecast information, system level forecast inter information. A singular place where they can see hourly forecast from all the vendors and all the models, and make a decision of uh, what forecast they want to uh, uh, use for operating uh, in the next 24, 48, 168 hours. Really, that's how 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 wide the uh, actionable uh, horizon for the for the control room can be. Uh, we'll also, uh, by the time this project is done, we'll also be ad adding a few additional forecasts. The specifically the uh, a, a concept of a blended forecast, which is a weighted average based forecast generated from the 
other uh, pure vendor forecasts that we have. Uh, and uh, we'll be bringing in override capability. Some of the th things I talked about uh, uh, that we today we have available through our vendors, uh, but uh, going forward by the end of this year, we'll, uh, the override capability will become native to our own tool. Uh, and then the control room will, of course, have the flexibility to override by a megawatt value, override by a percentage, however they however they see fit uh, uh, as be as a, as being a fit way to respond to the event that they are seeing. So here's a, a very uh, uh, quick uh, graphic that shows what the dashboard for the forecast presentation platform looks like. It's got a bunch of tabs which allows the uh, the, the user to tab between looking at the hourly fo uh, wind forecast from hourly solar forecast, the intra-hour wind forecast. We also have probabilistic forecast brought into this tool so they can look at those. Uh, the main dashboard lets them see when was the last time or when was when did we receive the most latest set of forecasts? Uh, what 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 is the hourly forecast uh, looking like from all of the vendors from all of the models and how is it tracking? So there, there's the hourly forecast, the solar forecast, uh, the the intra hour forecast are also plotted here, and they can uh, they have the ability to uh, actually. Uh, in this view, change the date and refresh the data and look at uh, a different day altogether, be it in the past or future. Uh, within the hourly forecast, here's one more uh, snippet of how the dashboard looks like. Uh, they have the ability to focus on just the system level data or they can toggle in and look like individual uh, resources or even regions, however they please. And of course, the what date they are looking at is in their control, so they can change the date uh, to be yesterday or tomorrow, just depending on what type of analysis they are doing. Now, this graphic is all also followed by a table, which shows the which shows the numeric values on which those charts were based. And really, this is where uh, uh, this sort of a view is where the control room is even able to make a selection. On, uh, on what forecast from amongst all these models will be active. The active forecast is then fed into our operating plans uh, for, uh, for the future, for, uh, for all resources and used in our studies. Uh, now, in addition to all of these changes, one, uh, one other significant uh, change that we made, which is worth calling out, is we, in, uh, in around 2018, implemented a performance-based payment structure for our wind forecasts. Uh, and really, the purpose of uh, those, uh, that, uh, that structure was to incentivize improvements in forecast performance during hours that were most important to operational reliabilities. So uh, we, we call them high risk hours. Uh, these are hours where typically we see uh, there's a risk of a net load up ramp or they are peak hours uh, in summer, winter, peak hours in general. Uh, the, the second set of hours, uh, the second set of hours that we again focus on uh, improving performances is when there are large down ramps. Uh, so uh, uh, for the purposes of what you're seeing on this graphic, uh, we've used 2000 megawatt as the threshold for down ramp. And so when there is a, the magnitude of change in forecast is more than 2000 megawatt, how did the, uh, how, the how did the, uh, how did the forecast perform? Uh, and uh, and uh, I mean this particular approach uh, for payment is a really a paradigm shift from how we traditionally measured forecast performance, where as wherein we would just look at a singular monthly uh, average value to to uh, to uh, express performance of the forecast for the entire month, all hours in the month. So. The, now, uh, generally, uh, what we've noticed is through this, we've certainly been able to incentivize improvements in these critical hours. We have seen reduction in the mean absolute error, the megawatt value of the error, uh, but of course, our, our fleet is also growing. So, uh, so, so there is some amount of natural growth you expect in the MAE, but we've been able to clamp that growth uh, 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 through the uh, through work, through looking at uh, performance through this lens, and of course, working with our vendors to continuously improve that performance. Here in 2022, we are looking to introduce a similar structure for our 
solar forecast also. And we've learned quite a bit uh, from our, uh, from our uh, the original methodology that was set up and we've made tweaks to the, uh, um, so some, uh, some tweaks to the, the methodology we'll be using for solar. Um, Next thing that is of uh, that I uh, that is of in, that is interesting as a change we made uh, in the middle of last year is uh, we've instituted what what we call as a, a net load variability assessment. Uh, this is an assessment that is done on a daily basis, looking uh, uh, at uh, up to two days out, so the, the current day, next day, and the day after. And the purple, uh, and it's typically run by our uh, by our meteorologists. The, the their focus is really to identify if the the oncoming weather forecast um, in really the day plus two horizon is uh, is something wherein they see variability, which our forecast, uh, which our vendors and which our forecast models or weather models have typically struggled. To capture correctly, and as a result, there is a possibility that the net load may come in higher than what is being predicted right now. And they look to do this assessment and try to um, uh, try to uh, uh, qualify uh, what they think the level of risk is. And they've come up with uh, we've come up with some megawatt metrics for what a low risk, a medium risk, and a high risk is. So if any day or uh, gets uh, uh, gets classified as at being at a high risk for a net load forecast error, we may go in and buy additional ancillary service, so additional operating reserves, so that we have sufficient ability to uh, react to the uh, to the event should it materialize. Uh, so since having instituted this uh, net load variability evaluation, we've used it uh, for about nine days each uh, in 2021 and 2022. Really, we we started using the process in about middle of last year. So since last year, we've used it about 18 times. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing uh, that I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, sharing with you also is so we do have an intra-hour wind and an intra-hour solar forecast. We use these forecasts to derive a forecasted ramp rate uh, of the, for these resources, and uh, through this uh, we look to uh, look to uh, update the dispatch we send to our thermal resources for the next five minutes. So if we expect a uh, let's just say a 300 megawatt down ramp. In our wind resources, we may push the, uh, uh, we may ask for 300 additional megawatts on the, uh, the from our thermal fleet. Uh, so that so that sort of a concept, and uh, uh, and uh, really through this we've been looking to reduce the, uh, the reduce the amount the burden of uh, on relying on our regulation reserves. Uh, to react to the variability we see within uh, uh, due to ramping of wind and solar resources within the five minute dispatch. Um, and also uh, help with frequency recovery if we are in an event and the wind and solar is ramping in the wrong wrong direction, so to speak. Uh, so here's a graphic which shows uh, uh, what our uh, predicted solar ramp rate, how our predicted solar ramp rate has performed. This is for the month of May 2022. If we had used persistence, uh, the uh, mean absolute error uh, uh, would have been around 120 megawatts. But by using predicted uh, ramp rate, we've got three different methodologies. We can reduce that error to about 70 megawatts. And really, if you focus on uh, uh, five minute intervals where uh, the change in solar was greater than 100 megawatts, the uh, the benefit you start seeing improve even further, where with persistence, the uh, the average MAE is around 230 megawatts, but with the uh, but with the uh, with having forecast and uh, being able to predict a ramp rate, we are able to reduce it to about 88 megawatts. Um, <clears throat> So, and lastly, and I realize we're probably at time, 
uh, you if you've been following uh, some of the uh, 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 some of the events that a uh, conversation around events that have been coming out from our region uh, one one challenge that we are right now working through is uh, uh, really we are, are we require inverter based resources to be able to write through uh, events uh, be uh, for voltage and uh, frequency events without tripping or reducing their uh, capability that fall within our uh, within the bands that have been established however what we've re noticed in uh, here in the recent uh, or we've noticed i'll just say the, uh, the recent years is demonstrated performance that uh, that uh, uh, from our, our inverter based resources, so the, not just wind and solar, but other inverter based resources as well, that uh, wherein, uh, uh, wherein uh, post disturbances, these resources are operating in a way that negatively affects reliability. We have seen events wherein IBR uh, 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 resources have tripped or reduced output uh, during uh, system fault events. And we are right now actively engaged uh, in analysis of these events and trying to understand the underlying issue and identifying actions to mitigate the same. Uh, there was a report that was a NERC event report that was recently published uh, around an Odessa disturbance, which gets into detail on one such event that happened last year. Uh, and so this is certainly one of those uh, topics that uh, we right now have a lot more attention put on at our end uh, in trying to make sure we can put in uh, uh, put in uh, uh, we can work with the inverter vendors and uh, institute changes that will uh, truly make these resources behave the way we expect them to behave. So with that, I'll pause. I think this is my last slide, uh, uh, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions you all may have. That's quite a quite a walk through the, uh, <laughs> the history of forecasting down there in ERCOT. Thank you for that. I want to start off the questions with just uh, one or two sort of human factors or human interest questions. Okay. And uh, the first is, how have the operators in the control room reacted, or how, how have you Notice their uh, sort of change in in uh, reaction to the forecasting system as you went from no wind forecasting yeah. system to the, the system that you have in place today. Actually, uh, so uh, everything evolves incrementally, right? And we've really seen a lot of positive feedback. Just uh, uh, so j uh, when we originally started in two thousand nine ten. They, they had a, a, a vendor's website that they used to interact and get, get a feel for what the wind uh, will look like and uh, do whatever analysis they had to do uh, by looking at uh, the uh, our cards displays for load forecast and available capacity. So they, 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 they really didn't have a good automated way of tying the two together. They had to figure out how to work through it. So the, when we made that very first change of even bringing all of the information that they would need to analyze and understand how the wind is going to behave in the next seven days uh, in front of them in the EMS. Uh, it, it was a, a, a visible support because uh, it, it saved them so much time and effort. They were going into a, a single point of information, a single uh, portal that they knew very well. And then when we started adding these what if analysis where we took that data and put it into perspective of saying, look, if you change your selection from here to here, because you see you're seeing uncertainties, this is how your outcome will change or this is how your outlook for the day will change. You go from suddenly look, you go from looking like a very normal day to a not so normal day anymore to a tighter day. So that, I mean, we certainly received a lot of uh, support and encouragement from them to continue going down this path of incrementally giving them more and more tools and more and more visibility so that they could do their jobs of running the grid so that they had a better understanding of uh, what to expect. I mean, even the simple things as being able to know what resource should be curtailed and is not uh, following the dispatch instruction. Uh, was uh, appreciated so well. So we've certainly received a lot of support from our control room in all of these incremental changes that we've made over the years. 
Yeah, it must have been interesting to watch. And my second question is related. Uh, what kind of input have you gotten from the uh, control room operators in your changes that you've made oh, we in the work, evolution of the system? We work very closely with them. So, uh, in fact, the very first time, so when we were doing this in 2018, we were able to borrow uh, a senior operator to come sit with us to design this tool to design how the, the interaction would look, to design how the selection philosophy would work, um, and uh, what pieces of information we would put on them. So we got really lucky there. But uh, even now, when, as we are working on forecast presentation platform, we work very closely uh, with, the, uh, with the desk that is primarily responsible for monitoring forecasts. We, we take ideas back to them, get their feedback, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and work, uh, work it through that channel. Yeah, sounds like a very important uh, feedback loop to right. uh, progress together. Right, right. Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'm going to move to the uh, Slido. I see we've got about uh, a couple dozen questions in here. So, I'll just go through the most popular ones. From the ERCOT point of view, what is the acceptable error range for solar and wind forecasts? And how is this uh, anticipated to change with growing IRR capacities? <laughs> so really, I don't know if I, uh, I, you're not going to get a good answer from me. Uh, lower the better is what it is. Like we've said, <laughs> like we've said, we've now switched our focus to where we are more focused on ours that are risky, ours that we know are going to be tight. If, if we have a good understanding, uh, uh, if the forecasts match how they will, uh, how the resources uh, will, uh, how, how the weather will actually play out. We can uh, we can work around it. We can plan for it ahead of time. We can make the dispatch decisions we need to make. So really, uh, uh, that, uh, that that was one of the reasons why we even uh, when we even put this pay for performance concept in place, we focused on those risk hours and we said really tighten your performance here. If you can focus in these hours, uh, and help us do our jobs well. The rest of the hours, uh, the, the the band can be a bit wide because we understand uh, weather can play uh, uh, tracking weather and answer weather variability in Texas is certainly a challenge uh, for many resources. So, uh, in the metric itself, to answer the question of how we account for growth, there is a scaling factor that is included in the quantitative assessments that we do. Uh, which takes into account uh, what the projected growth is going to be. Uh, and we set it in January every year based off of what we project our uh, future growth would be, but it uh, it doesn't proportionally grow the forecast. It grows it at a lower rate. Uh, but, so, but there is a, there is certainly, a, we, do ex, uh, we do expect to see some growth uh, just because of a native increase in the uh, installed capacities. Uh, and with that, that focus on the, the risky hours, I think the mm -hmm. probabilistic information in your forecast is going to get more and more important as time Correct. goes on. Correct. Uh, Absolutely. Um, how do you merge the different forecasts that you receive and how do you decide which one to use? And an ensemble in-house model or something else? Right, so right now we don't have an ensemble in-house model. That is what I called as the blended forecast, which we will be uh, looking to get the capability of even putting together later on this year. Today, it's really, uh, uh, we have uh, six, so for the hourly forecast, we have six different models, three from each vendor. Uh, and and four of them focused on extreme weather. So really, we only look at them uh, when there is an event, a weather event, an extreme weather event upcoming. So think of uh, of the uh, winter storm from last year, or even earlier this year when we had really extremely cold weather and there was icing, blade icing that we were expecting. On those days, it is those four forecasts that we look at, and of course. Uh, work with our meteorologists to understand what they uh, uh, what they think the level of risk is uh, and uh, when i really uh, we use meteorologists both that ERCOT has and our vendors have really in uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, gauging uh, what the right model to use is if the if we expect there to be extreme icing that will have a wide area impact 
we may pick a very conservative forecast for that day. Uh, if we don't, uh, if we don't think that uh, it's going to have a widespread impact, we may not pick as conservative. So that is how we think about cold weather or weather uh, extreme weather events. On day to day basis, uh, again, uh, that leaves us with two primary vendors to select from or two primary forecasts. Both of these forecasts have a um, 50% probability of exceedance. Um, and, and really, what we do, uh, what we take into account in selecting which, uh, which of the two to use is base it on how the forecasts have been tracking. How have they performed in the recent past six, eight hours? Who has been better in telling us uh, how the weather event has been moving? And generally, when we make a foc we, we, uh, our forecast selection changes when we are looking to make that decision, we are really looking to make that decision for the next 24 to 48 hours only. So typically, we don't look further out uh, in that assessment. We have one default model selected for the future hours, and that continues to be what is what continues to stay used. On the okay. intra, yeah, uh, one more. On the intra hour side, it's fairly similar, uh, simple. There's only uh, one weather, one vendor model that we have selected based off of history. We've so far uh, not seen the other for, for performance come to a level where we can change it. So, all right. This next question, I think you answered it um, as you went through that part of the presentation. But in the graphs shown, there were synchronized and non-synchronized wind, solar, and storage. Could you elaborate on the difference? Right. So, uh, when, when we track. Uh, Resources that are interconnected into our grid resources get modeled in our system in our network model well before. Um, they have, uh, they are ready to operate commercially. So, 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 so when we start tracking, uh, so the solid colors that you were seeing are resources that have gone through that are in the model that have gone through all commissioning st stages uh, that have tested that have shown that they can uh, they can meet our performance expectations and are uh, commercially operable in the grid so they are uh, they can participate in the energy market and even provide ancillary services should they be qualified uh, the the ones that are in uh, that are not in that category that are in the process of synchronizing are somewhere in that uh, uh, process of um, getting um, What's the word? Uh, get, getting energized, uh, get uh, getting synchronized, and uh, can, uh, actually even building their fleet. So the way, uh, at least, the, I'll use wind farms as an example. Work they start by commissioning a few turbines and then add more on uh, as as the project grows. So they are somewhere in that process where they have not fully brought on all their turbines online. They've not fully tested the entire. Uh, uh, the, the entire uh, 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 project uh, to meet ERCOT's uh, complete standards. So ERCOT has not yet green lighted them for market operations. Okay. Um, this is an increasingly popular issue around the world, uh, issue in ERCOT as well. How do you measure system inertia? <laughs> Uh, today we measure system inertia based off of uh, it's a, a simple analysis that is based off of the resources, the generation, the thermal resources that we have online uh, in real time, uh, and uh, we we get their inertia constants from the dynamic models that they provide us. So if the unit is online, it's counted as providing inertia. If the unit is not, it is not. It's as simple as that, and uh, we are only monitoring the the thermal utility scale resources uh, that are connected. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of interesting approaches to that around the world. Mm -hmm. A lot of different ones. Um, are the wind and solar forecasts location specific, so transmission congestion issues can be seen ahead of time? Everything shown is system or regional aggregates. Uh, our wind and solar forecasts are generated at resource level and then summed up to system level. So they are uh, location specific. And they get so, used in our studies at resource level also. So if there is a congestion analysis running, it is taking into account what the forecasted generation from the IRR resources. So you've got nodal information for all uh, of that. Um, can you expand on the absolute error of the forecast? Is there any prevalence with 
under forecasting or over forecasting? And is it different from wind versus solar? Uh, yes. Uh, well, so let's see. Right now, where, uh, all of the numbers that I shared with you were mean absolute error. So they don't take sign into account. I don't think I have any graphic which uh, shows a comparative between over and under. Now, typically we've used a 50% uh, uh, probability of exceedance. So we are really looking for unbiased forecasts. Uh, um, uh, however, we have noticed uh, at least uh, in our, uh, I mean, our wind is, uh, uh, has been around, our wind system has been, our wind fleet has been fairly steady and growing, uh, uh, and growing not at the same pace as solar resources. So its forecast performance has fairly been unbiased. Uh, on the solar side, we are still, uh, uh, we do see there are days when we do see uh, an over forecast bias. Be it because uh, we did not provide our, our our vendors did not get the right information around resource availability, uh, or uh, or that they uh, or that they didn't have it or or that the uh, the power curves that they were using uh, weren't hadn't fully been uh, tuned or lined up with uh, how the resource actually behaves. So right now we are certainly seeing. Uh, uh, issues in our solar forecast side that we are actively working uh, with both our with the, both our stakeholders to improve their uh, the amount of input they provide and with our vendors to improve the type of models they use. Okay, we'll ask one last question uh, that's a little unusual or interesting, and then we'll uh, go ahead and wrap it up. <clears throat> Have you or your forecast providers explored using satellite imagery for solar forecasts? Mm. Oh. We have talked about it. Uh, so far, we've not been able to make more progress on that front. Um, okay, something for the future. We've right. got a lot of a lot of things for the future. Right. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, Natika, I really want to thank you for that very interesting walk through the ERCOT control room and all your forecasting applications. Mm -hmm. I know I learned a few new things, and I hope everybody else did as well. And as I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the video file has been posted and we'll get the responses to your unanswered questions posted as quickly as possible. We appreciate your engagement. And if you would like to stay engaged, I would invite you to participate in the next ESIG webinar on July 27th on the role of grid forming inverters in HECO's plans for meeting its clean energy targets and in our fall workshop in Minneapolis in October. Further information on the workshops and all of our webinars can be found on our website at esig.energy under events, and you're all invited to attend. Information on all of the GPST webinars can also be found at globalpst.org. Natika, again, I want to thank you for this very timely webinar and thank all of you for your interest. We look forward to seeing you again in the near future. In the meantime, everyone, take care, stay safe, and thanks again for your participation. Bye now.